So my name's Greg Podgorski. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Science, but more importantly for these events, I have the privilege of chairing the Science Unwrapped Committee. So I, again, it really is a privilege to work with people on planning talks out and to work with speakers like Vladimir and, uh, and, and to help get these events uh, prepared. There are a lot of thanks I, I need to give for these events because there are a lot of people behind each and every one of our Science Unwrapped events. First, I thank the Science Unwrapped Committee. We have representatives, representatives from every department on campus. Uh, I want to thank USU Media Productions, who does all the recordings of these events, and they're, they're an essential partner for us in Science Unwrapped. And I want to thank our many volunteers, and we really do have a lot of volunteers. I want to give a special shout out today because it's International Woman in Science Day, so a, uh, a UN recognized day. And we have some women's groups here. We have the Society of Women Engineers. We have USU Woman in Science. We have a single female from the Intex Science Club, or maybe the whole science club is there, but uh, Christiana Zhang is with the Intex Science Club. So a special shout out for all the women in science. And we have a whole bunch of volunteers who come every time. And I especially appreciate the volunteers that are here all the time, and I especially appreciate the people who are new to us, Science Unwrapped, and that includes tonight the Stokes Nature Center. So thank you very much. Um, our next talk after Vladimir's talk is going to be on March 17th, and I'll eventually do your introduction, Vladimir, because that's the, uh, the show tonight. But our talk on March 17th is by Molly Womack from the USU Biology Department. And her talk is titled, Croaky Shapeshifters, How Frogs Shapeshift Within a Lifetime and Across Millennia. Molly's a really good speaker and a really fun person. And uh, I think you really enjoy her talk on the 17th. But I think you'll also enjoy, in fact, I guarantee it, Vladimir Kulyukin's talk. And Vladimir is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science here at USU. I've gotten to know Vladimir a bit through some committee work uh, we've done together and through working with Vladimir on his, his talk. And uh, I'm going off task over here. And this Vladimir, I think, is a Renaissance man. Uh, you'll see a lot of different interests in his talk tonight. The formal part of the introduction is that uh, his research focuses on intelligent multi-sensor systems that can operate on low power devices for extended time periods and without access to external resources. All this stuff doesn't mean a lot until you see the talk tonight and you see these little tiny computers that work on their own and that's, that's a big part of what Vladimir does. He loves to apply that line of research to one of his very favorite subjects, and that's honeybees. And there's a branch of keeping bees called precision apiculture, and that is the investigation of honeybee colonies using artificial intelligence, scientific computing, and numerical analysis, and that's what you hear about tonight. But in addition to those research interests, Vladimir has interests in mathematics and logic. Uh, and on the initial write-up, it was uh, Goodell's incompleteness theorem. But I don't know what that is, and probably a few of you know what that is, so I'm skipped over that. But, but mathematics and logic. And I would never want to play board games with him because one of his other research interests is the properties of computable and partially computable elements of board games like chess and checkers and go and all those other things. Uh, Vladimir is a musician, so he plays classical guitar and violin, and I think you'll see his musical interests, interests tonight. Uh, and it probably goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. He really loves bees, especially honeybees. He is a licensed beekeeper who has been uh, doing this, that is keeping bees for the last 15 years, okay? So with that, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Vladimir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys. Um. So, hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Vladimir Kulyukin, uh, and um, um, I'm happy to see each and every one of you here tonight. And my talk uh, tonight, I will talk to you about, as soon as the title uh, comes up, 
right, okay. So um, I, I will talk to you uh, tonight about traffic music, solar harvest, computing with honeybees. Um, so uh, the famous American poet Muriel Rukeyser once wrote that the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. And some of those stories are strange. Some of those stories are funny. Some of those stories are sad. And some of those stories are beautiful, so long as you're attentive enough to see that beauty. And um, uh, tonight, I'll share with you three stories that I have come to appreciate and learn through my studies of computation with honeybees. And that's a story of vision. And by vision, I'm not talking about vision as a dreamlike state of mind about some future state of the world. It's about the act of seeing, direct perception through eyesight. And um, uh, a story of sound and science and art, and also uh, a story of solar and um, water. Why should we care about honeybees? Well, well, I care about honeybees because I love them. I'm a beekeeper, and uh, I find those insects fascinating. Right? I, I love working with them. Why should you care about honeybees right, if you're not a beekeeper? Well, the short answer is that the honeybee populations are declining all over the world. Right? And, if we, and not just the honeybee populations, it's also the populations of other pollinators. And um, uh, I, I um, uh, keep uh, seeing uh, publications that say that, well, every third mouseful uh, comes to us courtesy of the honeybee. I, I don't know about that. I, I, I've always wondered where do those uh, uh, calculations come from. However, what I do know for certain is that if we lose honeybees, we will lose apples and plums and raspberries and almonds and all those other wonderful things that uh, we get to appreciate in our delicious and healthy diet, right? So uh, the answer to this question is that I wouldn't want to live in the world without honeybees. Okay. Uh, there will be some uh, prizes tonight, some questions with, the pr with prizes. Right? Five, so watch out. Okay, so, <laughs> and you will, uh, okay, I will get three answers for every question, and we'll give the prize to the first correct answer, right? And each prize oh, will look like this, right? It contains five honey taffies, right? Okay, so five honey taffies. So this is to remind you that if we lose honeybees, we'll also lose honey. And if we lose honey, we will lose candies. And what kind of life is this without candies, right? Well, that's no life at all, right? Uh, so uh, as you munch on uh, uh, them, remember that we need honeys to produce these. And then there's another um, uh, part of this uh, prize, which is a small seed packet of bee-friendly um, flower seeds. Okay, so uh, I want you to uh, start a, go out there and start a small pollinator garden, right? With you or your friends, right? And if you're patient, oh, and by the way, this, this packet has daisies and Siberian wallflower and uh, uh, it has poppies and uh, uh, baby blue eyes and so forth, right? And so uh, go out there and uh, start a small pollinator garden. And if you're patient and attentive, the bees will come. Okay, and along with other pollinators, and uh, such, such as bumblebees and uh, butterflies, and um, uh, they will be grateful. Okay, and you will make a small uh, part of the world next to you a better place for all of us. Okay, all right, and then uh, finally, before we dive into things, um, I have an assignment for you. Okay. So um, professors always give students assignments, right? So you've come to listen to one, so you get an assignment. So I want you to, um, when the summer comes back, it's hard to believe now, but it will eventually. So uh, I want you to go out to a secluded place, uh, uh, lie on the grass, look at the sky, right? Inhale. 
And then I want you to blow a couple of dandelions, right? And as you watch those uh, seeds drift away, think about the beauty of this world, right? Because um, uh, it is beautiful and they're good for the bees and other pollinators. And uh, as, uh, as you see those seeds drift away, um, um, you will see the beauty and you will perceive the truth. And beauty is truth and truth is beauty. And it's always revealing itself to the eye uncluttered by longing. Um, okay, now let's, um, uh, let's talk about hives, right? Because a hive will feature prominently in each of those stories that I will be sharing with you tonight. So a hive starts with a bottom board. So this is a bottom board, okay? So you put it like this. And the important part for this talk is this part of the hive. It's called the landing pad, okay? This is where the bees land and this is where they take off, okay? So like so. And then, uh, let me move this out of the way, you have boxes. Beekeepers call them supers, right? Because they're put on top of the bottom board. So like so, it's just a box, right? Okay, let me align it. All right, so, and that's the hive of one of my mentors, Dr. William Meikel of the USDA Honeybee Research Lab um, in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, so wonderful man, so taught me a lot about electronic beehive monitoring and so forth. So, uh, and it has two boxes, right? So you can, yeah, it's like the one, 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 and two, right? Okay, so how many boxes do you need? Uh, well, probably four per season. So in Northern Utah, it's, um, well, late April to late September, right? Uh, okay, so, so it'll be about four boxes high. Okay, so what goes into a box? A frame. So this is Dr. Uh, uh, Mikkel holding a frame, but that's a real frame, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold a, uh, a very fresh frame, right? It's never been to a hive, right? Okay. So uh, what's, what's, what's in the frame? Well, this is where the bees raise their young. Well, first of all, they will draw wax, wax combs, right? And inside these hexagonal wax combs on both sides of the frame, they will raise their young and they will deposit pollen and honey um, and so forth. So these frames go into a box like so, right? How many per box? Typically 10, okay? And then you put the lid on top of the box and the most essential piece of the equipment, the brick. So to make, it, to make it steady, right, against the winds, right? Okay, so, so our hive is now ready. Well, there are no bees, but you can imagine that they will be flying out, out of here, um, uh, back and forth. Okay, so now, and that is, okay, that brings us to the first question, right? So we started the hive. Who lives in the hive? Workers. Okay. Good. Well, anybody else? Yes. Queens. Queens. How many? More like one. One. Okay. Good. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. The drones. Drones. Okay. Well, yes. Please. Okay, well, those are, well, okay, well, okay, yes, larvae, and then, and, and yes, yes, they do live in a hive. Those are babies, right? Baby bees. I am really at a loss uh, to whom goes the price, because, like, yeah, b b both, b all, all of those, right? Well, anyway, well, I'll give you, who's the youngest of the three? The youngest? Okay, well, then. <laughs> okay. Now, guys, if you uh, miss on candy, so there's plenty of you to try after the talk. Just, just come and come and help yourself, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. Well, thank you. So let's. Uh, this is Her Majesty the Queen. You can see this bee, a beautiful long bee, right? Uh, if I could master the yeah, this this is this is uh, this is she. Uh, and um, uh, Queen is the egg lay machine, right? Her job is to lay eggs. Right on both sides of the frame, on, on different on different frames. That's all she does, really. Okay. Now, uh, do you think that her life is royal, queenly? Everybody 
obeys her. No, I don't think so either, right? I said, actually, there's very little royal about um, uh, the life of the queen because if she's not productive, the colony will kill her. Or, or not, not productive, I mean not lays enough eggs, right? Or the colony will raise another queen, and then the two queens will fight. Only one will survive. Or one of them will depart, one of the queens will depart with a swarm, and the other will stay behind with the remainder of the bees. Okay? Or things get even more prosaic. A commercial beekeeper on hive inspection discovers that the queen is not productive, and he or she will kill her and replace her with a new one. That's called requeening. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so that's, that's the queen. Now, the drones. Somebody said drones here. Right, OK, we don't want to forget the males. <laughs> OK, so this is the drone. And uh, the drone can be recognized, so you can, you can look at this, this guy. OK, uh, OK, yeah. OK, so shorter, fatter body and bulging eyes, right, to see a queen. Because uh, the sole purpose of drones in life is to mate with the queen, right? And um, uh, as soon as the drone mates with the queen, he dies. So the lower part of the drone's body uh, gets ripped uh, away, and then he just falls and dies. That's it, OK? So uh, now, uh, but the nice thing about the drones, if you can identify one during your hive inspection, right, you can put him on the palm of your hand and just look at them. They're friendly. They won't sting. They can't. <laughs> OK. So uh, how many drones per hive? About a couple hundred, maybe a thousand, right? OK. And what's worse, what if uh, the queen mates with 15 to 20 drones? And then she doesn't need them anymore uh, after she comes back to the hive, after her mating flight, because she fertilizes the eggs with the sperm that she gets from the drones. OK, what happens to the drones that don't get to mate? When the winter comes, they are mercilessly pushed out of the hive because there's not enough food. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the fate of the drone. OK, and finally, there may not be enough food. And finally, there is, um, let me get a drink of water. Uh, finally, uh, there is uh, worker bees. Right? And those are the bees uh, that you get to see in the flowers. And uh, this is the bee on the right slide, all right, with pollen baskets on, the hind, on her hind legs. Uh, so bringing pollen. Pollen is like bee bread. So uh, this is uh, um, dust from flowers. This is what the bees used, used to feed their young. Okay. Um, okay. Now, let's talk about um, um, a computation. Start beginning our conversation computation with honeybees. So, uh, I am a computer scientist, which means a nerd, right? Pretty much by definition. So, I do spend a lot of time in front of my computers, right? I do. And then I have a small lab space cluttered with all kinds of junk on the fourth floor of Old Main. So you wouldn't want to even visit there. So I, I am afraid of getting into, into that room. So uh, this is where I build things and, and, and run my algorithm and so on and so forth. But uh, my other research labs are in commercial apiaries and, and private apiaries all over northern Utah. So and this is what I look like when I am in my other research lab, right? So uh, the, 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 the upper picture is, uh, uh, was a while ago, in uh, North Logan, and the lower picture is in Logan. So, OK, so let's talk about the story of vision. We're getting into the lab, OK. Now, uh, what is uh, one of the first questions that we can ask the hive is, can I see your traffic hive? Why is that an important question? Because beekeepers, well, especially experienced ones, they can look at the hive just visually and uh, as use the traffic um, in the vicinity of the hive as an assessment of the hive's health. Right? If the hive is ailing, then the traffic will decline. If the hive is dead, and it happens, 50% of the hive annually, hives die. Right? So um, uh, if the hive is dead, there won't be any traffic. 
right? And if the hive is healthy and robust, you will see, especially during the nectar flow, you will see a lot of traffic in the vicinity. So how can we ask the hive the question about uh, vision? Well, we can start uh, building devices. So, and you can look at the right slide, right? Because this is the picture of the same device. You see the camera, right? Okay, the camera is, it's not working, don't worry. It's not, it's not taking pictures of you. You're not bees, right? So, uh, well, as far as I can tell, right? Um, okay, so, so this is the camera. And then when you turn the device around, you will see this computer is called Raspberry Pi, right? P-I, right? As in the Greek letter pi. So hence, the, the name of this device is B pi, B as in B and pi as in P-I, right? The Greek letter pi, right? And it's a very, very small computer, right? And it's coupled to the camera. And the camera is going to just start taking videos, right? And uh, voraciously, greedily, and start processing them, right? OK, now, but we need storage, right? Um, a large storage, because the, uh, the, the, this Raspberry Pi is not powerful enough by itself. It has a very small amount of memory, right? So we need this memory, right? And it's a big disk, 5 terabytes, 10 terabytes. So, so Well, OK, if you don't know what a terabyte is, it's a lot of data, a lot of data, right? So to last a whole, a whole beekeeping, beekeeping season, right? So. Because we do not want to go to the internet or to the cloud computer farms, right? For reasons that hopefully I will make clear in my story three, right? Story of energy and story of water. Okay. And then what is this? This is power cord, right? Well, this, this guy needs power. So we're, we're, we're going to postpone the discussion of how this thing is powered. But let's assume it's powered, right? Somehow. And it's a big, and it's a big sub. So we're gonna take and put this, put this on, and put the lid, right, and put the brick, brick back in. So never forget the brick, right? <laughs> so I, I suffered a lot, lost a lot of this equipment to strong winds. <laughs> so that's that's why I never, I never forget the brick. Okay, so now. The camera is just beginning to take videos, right, continuously, right? How big is the area of the hive, in front of the hive, that it, that it can cover? Well, you can approximately three meters by three meters by three meters, height, width, and, uh, um, and what is it, length, right? So it's about a cube of space, right? And it's going to be taking those videos. Now, once we have those videos, right, what can we ask? What kinds of questions can we ask of those videos? Okay, we can, the very first question that we can ask is that how many hives are, uh, how many bees are flying, right, in the vicinity of the hive, right? And you can, I hope you can see those squares, right? Let me, um, this, is, this, is, this is a uh, video frame from a hive in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, let me uh, move uh, through uh, three frames from that video uh, very slowly, right? So, so this is one, two, three. See the movement? Okay, let's go back, right? One more time. One, two, three, right? And those rectangles uh, have different colors. The colors have meaning because if it's a green rectangle, the algorithm that processes the video, and by algorithm I mean just a step-by-step -step procedure that can um, solve a problem, right? So if the algorithm colors something as green, it means I am pretty certain there is a bee in that area of the image. If the algorithm colors uh, something as a blue rectangle, then there may be, right? Maybe a bee, maybe not, right? But uh, by and large, the algorithm is pretty smart and, uh, and can count the bees. So we can now have bee counts. And uh, uh, these images are coming at the camera 25 images per second or as they say, 25 frames per second. So you need to be really, really fast. Okay, so this is a very slow motion. 
Now, what's the set? And so, so now we can say, well, Hive, how many bees have flown in the last hour? Well, I don't know, um, 113. I love prime numbers, so I just made it up. Okay, so uh, in a, uh, let's say, well, yeah, okay. Well, you're doing okay compared to this other hive because nobody's flying there, right? Or you're declining compared to your performance last week, right? Okay, so well, we can ask a harder question. And this is, guys, this is a much harder question, right? Uh, hive, can you tell us anything about directional flights, okay? So uh, direction means how many B motions are toward the hive and how many B motions outward of the hive. And then there's also another very important question, how many B motions are in parallel to the hive? Because parallel motions uh, are very, very important too. Okay, so uh, I hope you can, all right, let me move this out of the way because I'm gonna break my neck eventually. So, all right, um, uh, can you see this arrow, right? Okay. It's called a vector in computer science. What's a vector? It's just an arrow, <laughs> but it has, it has uh, uh, two types of additional information, direction and speed or distance, okay? So, and you can see uh, this is a B, a circle, right? That contains a B next to the arrow. So watch very carefully the, uh, that arrow in the next couple of frames, right? This is from Gas Valley, California, this summer, okay? So one, two, three, four, okay? One, two, three, four, right? So we split the space in front of the hive into grid cells, right? And as the bees uh, fly, as, as an individual bee flies through the air, parts of its body leave behind small traces of motion, right? And then, well, we call them motion particles. Uh, and once we identify, well, like wings and thorax, that's the equivalent of the neck and abdomen and so forth, right? And in each of those cells, we can trace those traces, right? Well, detect those traces, right? And once we have detected them, then we can use the um, methods from fluid mechanics. Those are like very smart guys, uh, like from in, in, in engineering, and they study how fluids move, right? Water and gas and so forth, right? And so we can use those techniques uh, to figure out the directions of, of individual B motions, right? Now, we can say, well, so many bees have moved toward the hive, and so many bees have moved outward the hive, right? Uh, uh, away from the hive. And see this arrow, right? Something moved parallel to the hive. Why do we care about parallel motion? Okay, well, um, Let's say that I'm going to turn this to face. This is, this is our hive, and uh, it's getting weak. The queen is getting sick, right? Or it start, oh, the queen is laying only drones. She doesn't produce worker bees, right? So the hive is declining. Female, uh, female, tra okay, female bees from other, worker bees from other hives, start scouting, right? Is this a weak hive? If they discover that this is a weak hive, okay, so this scout flies back to her hive, summons her sisters, then they come back and they rob this hive blind. So an Amazon warrior attack, right? So they will take all of the resources. They won't kill anybody, but the resources will be gone, like nectar, pollen, and, and, so, and, and so forth, right? Now, and that's, uh, well, this is how nature works, right? Now, uh, if it is another insect, like the Asian hornet, for example, those guys will not only, when they attack the hive, those guys will not only take the resources, they will kill, okay? So, um, so that's, uh, that's how, uh, that's how, uh, that's the kind of world uh, in, which, um, bee colony, uh, in which bee colonies exist. Okay, now, what do um, uh, all those wonderful data, directional flights and uh, bee counts give us? They give us 
motion patterns. Right? And so those two graphs are the motion patterns of two hives, outgoing motions and incoming motions. And if they match more or less, then we're OK. okay? So uh, if there is a discrepancy, a lot, of, a lot of bees going out versus coming in, um, then it might be a swarm. If a lot more bees coming in versus going out, right, then it might be a robbing attack. Right? Right, and, uh, and we can analyze those motion patterns to uh, compare different hives for productivity and also to compare the same hive for productivity because motion unfolds in time. Right? Okay, so um, now how long do we get to see the motion of a worker bee? That's the next, that's the next question. Yes? 20 days, yeah, good. Okay, well, it's, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yes, good. Uh, you got it, man. So um, um, bees, um, right, oops. Uh, a bee lives approximately six weeks. So she's born, she starts nursing the young and cleaning the cells. Okay, so that's two, the first two weeks of her life. The next two weeks of her life is she gets to be the guard. For the reasons I just explained to you why, why it's important to have guards in, in the hive. And then only, only in the last two weeks of her life, she gets to forage, right, to become a forager. So foragers are pretty mature and experienced bees. So they get to fly and bring water and pollen and, uh, and nectar. Right? Okay. So um, now let's talk about the sound, the story of sound. Um, we can, I didn't bring, unfortunately, a microphone, but you can um, uh, place a microphone and drop it down to approximately well, about 10 centimeters above uh, the landing pad. You can also put the mics inside, but I wouldn't recommend it because the bees propolize it. Okay, prop propolis is this raisin-like quality that the bees use to disinfect their hives, right? And they propolize uh, all of the foreign objects inside the hive. If there's a mouse, that ventures into the hive, the bees will kill her and then propolize her. Okay, so, so to just to, 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 to disinfect, to protect the hive against infection, right? Okay, so, but uh, if we, uh, so right, right over here, right? So it's, a, it's about like above, above the hive. Why do we care about sound? Again, because uh, hives in different states of their health sound different, right? Uh, there is a robust buzzing in a healthy hive, then uh, there are lots of research on that, guys, which we don't have the time to get into, that ailing hives buzz differently. Queenless hives buzz differently, okay? So it's nice for us to analyze the sound in addition to the traffic because it gives us, um, well, not only time information, but also give you, gives us additional information about the state of the hive, right? Okay, so... Uh, how many, uh, how many uh, uh, bees do we get to listen to in a healthy hive? That's a question. Yes, please, sir. 10,000 bees. 10, bees. Okay, well, your answer is taken. Okay, anyone, <laughs> anyone else? No, they're good, good. Yes, yes. 1,000? One One, did you say 1,000? 1,000, 1, okay, all right. Yes, please, 5, sir. 5,000, good, okay. Yes, gentlemen. 30,000, okay. Anyone else? Yes. 200, 200, okay. Okay, yes. Oh, oh yes, 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 please. <laughs> yes, you, you, yes, I didn't see you. How many? 8,000, 8, okay. 80,000, okay, you get the price. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, your answer is close, was closest. So, uh, about 60, so sorry. <laughs> so, so, this is the closest, okay? Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, so um, uh, one queen, okay? About a couple hundred drones. So your answer was about drones, probably, right? 
guys, right? <laughs> Males, right? Okay, well, uh, no, well, they, they can get up to a thousand, right? Okay, but, but and, and the rest of them are worker bees, like female worker bees. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, good. Now, what does the sound look like um, uh, if we analyze it? It looks like this. And on the right hand side, you see these tubes. Well, they don't look quite like a tubes, but it's, it's its amplitude, how loud the hive is. So when you uh, puff some smoke onto the hive, right? So you inspect and like inspect the hive, you puff some smoke. Well, I'm not going to inspect the equipment with smoke, but I puff, <laughs> puff the, some smoke into the hive. They start getting mad at you. Right? And it's like, so so the, the, the volume rises, right? Um, okay, yes, please. Can it deafen you? Can what? Can it deafen you? Can deafen, deafen you? No. <laughs> no, it, it can't. Um, well, not, not me. <laughs> so, uh, um, okay, so, um, and then, uh, like at night, right, when everything's quiet, it's like a whisper. Almost, almost nothing, right? So, so that, that's, that's the amplitude, right? And, and then uh, the pictures on the right, that's um, frequency analysis. Let's say um, all of them, I'll try to be as simple as possible, right? Because I was, when I was presenting it to uh, Greg for my practice talk, he said, well, Vladimir, you just overwhelm everybody with your jargon, right? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, I try, I try not to. So, um, okay, uh, every, um, every sound uh, in this universe can be looked at as wave, right? So my voice uh, is, it has a pretty high pitch, right? So if you get, um, uh, uh, compute the frequencies of my voice, they will be waves like this, oscillating, very, very frequent, right? Very frequent oscillations. And then if you listen to, let's say, I don't know, a Buddhist monk, Chant, chanting in Sanskrit. Oh, okay. Well, I cannot do this, right? But, uh, but, but it'll be a very low, right? Low wave, like low frequency. Very few oscillations, right? Okay. And those frequencies can be numbered. Frequency number one. Frequency number two. Frequency number uh, twelve hundred, right? Well, it's not a prime, I think. Well, okay, thirteen. So thirteen is a prime, right? So, um, uh, okay. And, and so this, um, like the, 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 these are frequencies, various frequencies, and this, okay, how much of a frequency is present, okay, in, uh, in an audio sample. So this frequency is present, okay, this much, and this frequency is, well, absent, right? They're present very, very small amount. So again, this gives us Again, fingerprints, right? Audio fingerprints of the hive that we can use to analyze the hive, right? Is it a good hive? Is the is the queen alive? Is uh, is 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 the hive ailing? Is the hive? so I read in a very interesting paper where um, a researcher uh, was exposing the bees to various chemical poisons, and they did sound differently. Every poison induced a different frequency. That was wild, you know, but, but that was, uh, that, that's, what, that's what people, that was people do. Okay, so, so we can use it again to analyze different aspects of the hive state, health, right, and behavior. Okay, now we can ask a more unusual question, right? <laughs> can bees play the piano, right? Okay, so uh, is it an unusual question? Yeah, I, I bet. Well, so, somewhat unusual, somewhat unusual. Now, um, uh, this is a standard piano keyboard, uh, 88 keys, and every, every key on that keyboard has a frequency, like low frequency, high frequency, high, very high frequency, right? Uh, so uh, to, toward, toward the right, okay? And we can design methods that actually detect those frequencies in audio hive samples, right? and turn them, once you have detected frequency, what can they be of a note, right, of a key? What can you do with it? Well, you can turn it into a note, right? Right, like a, a real note, musical note, right? So it's something like this, right? <laughs> okay, this is above my skill level as an amateur musician, so I use the, an open source software to do this. Right. Um, uh, okay, to, 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 to line up a bunch of audio samples and convert them into a score. So what's, what's, your, what's the score, Hive? Right. So it looks like this. 
And then uh, uh, once you have the notes, well, well, you don't have to play the piano, right? You can imagine that, well, I want to listen to the hive as if it was a symphony orchestra. I like violins, right? <laughs> so far better than I like piano. Like, okay, no, no offense to piano players out there, right? Um, so, um, and um, I just want to give you a sense of what a hive sounds like if it plays a symphony, like an orchestra, like cellos and violins. I don't know who the director is. I guess the queen, right? We'll make her the director, right? Just a couple of, uh, just a couple of, um, uh, a couple of seconds, guys. If you're interested, I. You know, I can send you, uh, okay, I can, I, well, I'm not going to play it for a long time, right? Just, just a few seconds. If, but if you're interested to, to, to listen to the entire symphony, just email me. I'll be happy to <laughs> give, you, give you a link. Okay, let me, uh, okay. I've already uh, downloaded this. So let's, let's listen to it. No? I guess there is no... Silence. Okay, let me move move to the beginning. That's not like Greg's music that he played at the beginning of the lecture. Well, you, 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 get the, you get the drift, okay, <laughs> so, um, okay, um, yeah, all right, and uh, now, before I move to the next slide, I got to tell you another short story. Um, in 2016, I wrote a paper uh, about uh, digitizing audio hive samples into piano frequency. Sequences, right? Um, okay, sequences. Sequence. Can I use the word sequence? Greg? Okay, good. Thank you. So, um, uh, all right. Uh, then um, uh, I published it. Okay, and then sort of forget uh, forgot about it because a researcher always is thinking about the next paper, right? So, and then um, about a year ago, I get an email uh, from an artist. I um, well, okay, start reading it. And then um, it turns out she, she asks me very, very detailed uh, questions about that paper. Very detailed, very profound, you know, if you will. So um, I answer all, all of her questions, right? And it turns out that she's also a beekeeper. And uh, um, uh, one of her projects uh, is this. So she somehow managed to capture a wild swarm, right? and hive it in a big grand piano, old grand piano, no, nobody plays it, right? And then she started video recording and audio recording that hive, okay? So, and, um, yeah, where is my... <laughs> the name of the artist uh, is uh, Jessica Segal, and the name of her project is Project Terapolis, okay? So, um, and this, this is in, uh, I don't know what this is, and I don't know how to get rid of it, but hopefully it'll disappear, right? I mean, I, I don't know. So, but this is in her own words. In, uh, in the work Fugue in B-flat, we hear the recorded sound of buzzing bees colonizing and plucking the strings of a grand piano, right? So, and I thought it was so wicked cool, and, uh, uh, and, and it's a lot of bounds, you know. So, um, anyway, I've, I've never met her, and probably never will, oh, so never say, never say never, but it doesn't really matter because music and sound live us across space and time because, well, that's timeless, right? So, I want to play um, a few, uh, a couple of seconds of Fugue B in B flat, just for you to get the feel, right? It's not like a symphony, right? It's more like a new age music, right? So you hear, you hear buzzing, and then you hear the bees plucking at the strings, right? I want you to hear at least once, right? How they pluck at the strings of the piano, okay? Um, but you can, you can look her up and, um, uh, you know, listen. I, I recommend that you listen to this in your headphones, <laughs> okay? Um, So this is, and it's also, it's also video.
So um, let's see. Uh, do it full screen. That's. So, well, I think it's beautiful, but oh. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was a definite one, right? Okay, you, you've heard it. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, and go back to full presentation. Mm, okay, so um, uh, let's um, talk about something later. What's your favorite beekeeper joke? And the only reason I put this slide in because I want to tell you my favorite beekeeper joke, right? So you, you figured, right? So, um, so this is, uh, here goes. What profession has the most beautiful eyes? Beekeepers, because beauty is in the eye of the beeholder, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so another favorite of mine is like, there are two beekeepers who will give you five opinions on how to keep your bees. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so let's talk about the story of sound and, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, the story of solar and, uh, and water. Okay, so we come to uh, the question of how to power this, right? And we're gonna go for this uh, to Tree Mountain, right? Uh, this is one of my research labs uh, where I worked at a friend's private property, uh, um, okay? And, um, uh, right, you see this solar panel, right? And this is, a, uh, this is a box like this. And my uh, project was, okay, well, I'm gonna uh, put the microphone inside the hive and I'm gonna put the temperature inside the hive. And I'm gonna uh, get a lot of useful data for uh, 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 analyzing how the bees sound as they overwinter. They don't forage, they just stay inside the hive, right? And they need to overwinter. And what the temperature is like inside the hive, right? Okay, so I tested and I started writing my next paper, right? So I came up with the title and I came up with the abstract, a punchline, right? All right, now, two uh, months later, I uh, come to that uh, apiary and, uh, well, I, I, yes, I, I, put, I put this, uh, everything worked. I put the solar panel on top of this, uh, on this guy, right? So I see this picture. What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, well, nothing is wrong with this picture except 10 centimeters of snow on top of the solar panel, right? <laughs> so bye-bye uh, paper. So um, uh, I, I, I didn't get to, uh, uh, to analyze my wonderful data that I was supposed to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, have, uh, to have kept, okay? So, and this is me cleaning the snow off of that panel, right? So. Um, anyway, what, what I'm gonna, uh, there's, there's an important story here. I tried my best uh, to make the small solar work for the, uh, for the beehives. It simply didn't. Because by the time I burn a few gallons of gas going from Logan to Tremonton and back in my Jeep, it was definitely not worth it. <laughs> so so e e energy-wise, right? And, also, another takeaway that I want you to get out of this rather sad story, right, is that when computation moves into a real world, right, it starts having enemies, right? The sensors must be protected against the elements, snow, rain, hail, heat, uh, and so forth. Last summer, I deployed, well, deployed, okay, put 10 of such devices on, the, on, 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 on beehives in Arizona. Four of them were destroyed, as in completely destroyed by a windstorm, right? And it was not just my devices, it was the hives too. They were just blown apart, right? Okay, so remember that. It's a, we cannot go back and re-simulate a natural cycle. We have to wait until its next phase, right? And be patient, okay? So, um, what do computers require besides electricity? Okay, 
two bags for this. Uh, yes, sir. Input. Input. What they do. Okay. Yeah, that, that's good. Okay. That's not quite what I'm looking for. But, but yes, sir. Uh, yes. Okay, I'll come back to you. Yes, please. <laughs> say, say it again. Internet. Well, they, well n not all of them. But, but yes, a lot of them do. Uh, uh, yes, please. Okay. A component of the computer? A comp no. no. Okay, that's, no, no, that's cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, good, 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 good. We're getting warmer. It's getting cooler. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Code? Code. Yeah, lots of it. Absolutely. But it's not quite on the same, oh, excuse me, path. Uh, yes. Yes, you. Um, it also needs a router. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Memory. Well, they certainly do. Yes. An inverter. Well, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, yes, they do. They do. Yes, please. Okay, okay. Uh, the warmest answer is cooling, ma'am, so that I guess goes to you, so, right? But there is a, um, uh, let me take a long gulp of this substance. It's a beautiful substance. So, um, uh, all those models that I showed you at the beginning, right? So, so Hive counting, uh, the B counting models and audio analysis models, they cannot be developed on the Raspberry Pi. It's just simply not powerful enough, right? Okay, you have to go to more powerful machines, right? Like, like GPUs and everything, right? And train them. They require a lot of data. And what do they generate? They generate heat. When computers generate heat, what do they need? Cooling. How do we cool things? Say. Say it again. Louder. Louder. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, in computers, like to cool stuff off, you know how they put fans in there? Fans. Oh, fans. Fans. Yes. Yes. Sir. Yeah. 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 What? What? Fans are not going to do you any good, man. Right? So it's like if, if, if yes, okay. There's a magic word, right? Somebody louder, water, right? Water, water. Let's chant it, right? Like water, right? They, they need water. They need water, right? Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, yeah, you can use, yeah, you can use your hand and blow it out on the computer. It's not going to do much good, right? If, it's, if that computer is going to generate a lot of heat, right, it's going to help <laughs> much. But, but, but thank you, yes, absolutely. Now, um, so this is where the story of water begins, right? And um, so we need a lot of water to go to clusters of computers, right? And computer science, they're known as computer farms, right, data centers, right. And I'll give you a couple of statistics, right. This is from Salt Lake Tribune, uh, a story um, of, 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 in July uh, 2022. From June 2021 to May 2022, the top four data centers, data center owners in Utah alone consumed 149.8 million gallons, million gallons of culinary water. Culinary, they're competing with us. Okay, so that's the culinary water that we drink. Okay, millions. And this is, this is a pretty, I mean, it's actually a, a rare moment of intellectual clarity. Sometimes I wonder how that, did the journalist get those uh, numbers uh, from, from there? They, they typically stonewall you, right? Um, but, um, um, and it's a very low estimate because I know there's a lot more water that is required, right? Because a lot of my friends run their small private computer farms. And they're in nice air-conditioned buildings, 
and they require a lot of water. Right? So, so this is like an optimistic estimate. Right? This, this slide gives you a pretty, pretty optimistic estimate. OK, so um, tongue in cheek question. Where do clouds not give water? Yes? Good. OK. Well, OK, you finally get, get your prize. Thank you. OK, OK. OK, OK. Well, there's plenty, plenty more after the talk. So, but, um, well, it's a, you were on the right, uh, on the right track. Uh, the answer is in computer science, because they require water for cooling. So computer science has magic clouds. They, they don't yield, they don't give us water. They drink it and lots of it, OK? So um, and um, a few takeaways from my talk. So the story of vision um, gives, us, um, uh, well, gives us a hint on how we can use uh, computer vision and video processing to find patterns in, in, in beat traffic and use those patterns to assess uh, uh, hive's health, uh, the, the, hive, the health of the hive. The story of sound and science and art um, uh, tells us that we can find patterns in audio, right, samples that we take from the hive. And also, it tells us a beautiful story that science can meet art. And there's nothing wrong with art, right? If you're an artist, by all means, keep doing your art. Um, uh, um, it's just another way of perceiving the world. And sometimes they meet, and wonderful things happen. Uh, and then the story of solar and water tells us that uh, computation, as probably the most important uh, takeaway, has an environmental cost. And another thing that it tells us is computation has started a pretty serious competition with humans, plants, and, and, and animals for precious resources such as water. Right? It's a very serious and greedy competitor. Right? Okay. So. Um, I uh, uh, want to thank my uh, supporters, uh, all of my supporters, on my three open science, kick uh, open science Kickstarter funds in 2017, 2019, and uh, uh, 20, uh, 2021. That was, that was the last one. A lot of things that I showed and shared with you in, in my presentation uh, were purchased with that money. Uh, so um, OK, I'm, uh, the funds are over. Kickstarter only gives you two months, and it's, and it's uh, take it or leave it. So if you don't get to uh, meet your funding goal, no money is given to you. So I'm very, very grateful to those people. Right? If you want to know more about BeePies and how this thing is assembled and how this is installed on a live beehive, right, then by all means go to DuckDuckGo and search for Vladimir uh, uh, Kolyuk and BeePie honey meat, honeybees meat. Uh, meet AI or love AI. I mean, Kickstarter. It'll get you there. Lots of videos, right? And lots of lots of lots of pictures. I want to thank numerous private property owners in northern Utah who uh, gave me access and continue to give me access to their private property. I don't have much land, so I depend on those friends, uh, right, uh, for my continuous experiments. Uh, sometimes I drive them nuts. I know, uh, right? But <laughs> well, they, uh, so so far so good. Okay, um, and then I want to uh, I want to thank Dr. William Meikle and Ms. Milagro Weitz. Those are <coughs> two researchers uh, from the USDA Honeybee Lab in Tucson, Arizona, for uh, working with me. And finally, I want to thank the uh, Science Unwrapped Committee for um, uh, inviting me to share my stories with this wonderful audience. Responsive, thank you guys, right, for answering. I I was afraid that I'm going to keep those. Uh, prizes, but you've taken them all. That's good. Make sure to help yourself to the candy, right, <laughs> after, after the talk, and uh, for your helpful suggestions. So um, thank you. <laughs> and the question was, uh, well, what happens to those hornets, right? OK, my answer is I don't know. So I, um, I, I read an article about like, those robbing attacks and then watch a video of how they attack a hive. And they are having a field day. They just divide the bees in half and half. And they just go, go. Right, well, real quick, uh, yeah. I saw something about some of the uh, bees. 
I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's beyond my, beyond my knowledge as, as computer scientist and, and an entomologist, so don't know. So, yes, sir. Um, have you observed or do you have data uh, for a collapsing uh, hive? And do you see this movement of bees coming out and not returning? And what does that look like? Right, hive okay. Collapsing? collapsing hive does not, it's not a swarm, right? right? It's a slow death, right? And then the bees disappear. Right? They just like a you, you come, and then, but, but you, it's very, very difficult to detect in the terms of, like, the, 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 the traffic slowly dies out, and that's it. So, so I guess, like, a, a, as a practical, like, if you want to use something like this, when you start, when you start declining, and then you go, <laughs> go then they maybe feed them pollen patties or something, you know, because, yeah, they're failing, yes. Check for a role, mate. That's another, that's another. Well, you're a beekeeper, right? Okay, yeah. well, good. That's why I want to give them up for the second one. I have the last thing that would be you. Yeah, I wish. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, there are. There are. There are. Like bees have many predators. Yes, absolutely. Right. Most of them are birds or uh, drive cars. So. Question. Uh, yes, uh, sir. They they do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you would. Um, uh, I am. I am not a commercial beekeeper, so it's just nothing to write home about four or five hives a season, and I uh, get to keep them in Logan. So um, it's not worth it, uh, track it uh, to, to, for me to truck my hives to Florida uh, or to California. So now it's February, right? The almond pollination uh, started, but but yes, they they do truck commercial beekeepers spend a lot of time uh, trucking their bees from place to place. Yeah. Well, that's good uh, for you, sir, because like I lose about 50% of my well, hives no, every, every winter. They collapse. Yes, they, they do. They do. That's they the do. biggest problem right now is the collapse they, they do. Yeah, they do. They, they just die. So. I mean, so uh, you can bet on 50% of your colonies just die. If you overwinter here, you can wrap them and uh, they still die. And then you can treat them for varroa and so <laughs> they still die. And pro well, there's, that, that's a genetic problem probably because all of our queens, uh, well, m okay, m most of our queens, uh, they come from uh, California, like sunny parts of California, uh, California and, and Georgia. They're probably not genetically equipped to deal with this cold. And I, uh, I've heard only last, well, this, this, a couple of months ago, I've heard of a local beekeeper, um, uh, Homer's Honey. So you can look, look him up. Richard Homer, who raises his local uh, queens. Local, all right? So I'm gonna give him a chance, absolutely. So I really look forward to, you know, uh, testing your queen locally bred. Not truck. So they work out. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm going to try this mic here, and I finally figure out how to get the mic unmuted. Ready? So you talked about monitoring the health of the hive. Hmm. Are you comparing the hive to what it was previously, or is there like a frequency that all healthy hives ran? fall in this range? That's a great question. Um, uh, the true answer is that I don't know. Okay, n n true. Uh, the, the first part of your question is absolutely. I, um, I do compare um, the vitals, right, as I call them vitals, so, so traffic and audio and temperature, 
uh, to uh, what to the previous readings of the same kind, right? A absolutely. As to your second question, um, uh, my educated guess, and not not as an entomologist, a computer scientist slash amateur beekeeper, is that the answer to that would be no, because it depends on the location and the bee race. So. You're not gonna you're not gonna see the universally applicable patterns, you know, like panacea. Here is the formula, and you can apply it universally. It, I, I, yeah, I have not found one. Thank you, thank you, guys, for coming.